got up here this morning, it felt like it had been forever since I'd been up here. I was just going a week, you know, but I still, it just it seemed like it had been a long, long time. And uh, and, and I, I, I'm glad to be back. Well, y'all are not, that's another story. But before I left on Sunday nights, we were going through John and, and looking at John. And for the past several weeks, we had been looking at the, the incident where Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And we're still looking at it now. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In John chapter 11. Y'all, I was on the phone when I walked out the door while I go in the boat, and I think I swallowed it and that thing. <clears throat> I'm still trying to get it loose, okay? So bear with me. <clears throat> Everybody wants to know how the story ends, don't they? Amen. I mean, stop and think about it. Let me ask you, I like to read. I, I don't know about y'all, but I like to read. And there are times when I pick up a book and start reading, and, and I just can't quit. I just, I, I just, you know, every page I go, wait a minute, what happens next? What happens next? You know, and I, and I, Jeff Collins, bless his heart, he said, hey, I got a book you might enjoy reading. You were a police officer. This was about a case in South Georgia in the early 1900s, and you probably missed it. He said, but I'm going to tell you, when you start, you ain't going to be able to put it down. He was right. He handed it to me one day. I was done with it the next day. And I thought, man, that was a good book. You know, everybody wants to know how the story ends. It, 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 you can do that with a book. You ever, you know, I, I did this one time. I had to get up early to be at work early the next day, and and I was sitting there and I was watching something on television. The program went off, and they and they they showed a, a clip uh, of what was coming on next. And I thought, boy, that looks interesting. And I knew better than to start watching that program. By the time it was over, it was late, and I had to get up early, so I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. And I paid for it the next day. <clears throat> but you know, everybody wants to know how the story ends. And there are a lot of people that won't know, want to know how their life will end. Now see, if you ever get in a conversation with somebody and they start talking about, well, I wonder what my story is going to wind up being like. You know, on the day that they buried me, what are people going to say about me? How will my life turn out? And there's a lot of people that want to know that right now. And you know what? There's this thing, this phenomenon, you know, and it's been around ever since Satan's been around. <clears throat> These people that call themselves fortune tellers. You know, there are a lot of people that go to them folks. They are. They are, yeah, horoscopes, palm readers, fortune tellers, you know, crystal ball, all that good stuff. What's the Bible say about all that? It says stay away from them people. And you know what? There's stories in the Bible about them kind of people, okay? They are. And uh, But people will go to these folks because they're uncertain about the future. They want to know what the future is. You know the way I look at it? I don't want to know how it turns out. I know how ultimately it's going to turn out. But you know what? I might see something I don't want to see. Now, my wife has done a lot of genealogical research on our families. And I told her, I said, look, when you start looking at mine, you might find some things you don't want to find. And she found them, and I thought, see, I told you, you don't want to know that stuff. I look at it that way about the future. But there are people who want to know what's going to happen you know, how their life is going to turn out. And they are afraid. That's why they go to these people that supposedly can tell them what's going to happen in the future. Because they are afraid of the uncertainty. Now, if you find somebody that is afraid of the uncertainty of the future, that's when you better start witnessing and telling them about Jesus real hard. Because you can tell them, look, you can have a certain future by putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Because Christ tells us right here how it's going to turn out for us. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, you know all this mess is going on, where do you think it's going? I said, heaven. That's the only place, that's the best answer I know to give you, is heaven. It's going, we're going to heaven. I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know any of that, but I know we're going to heaven. That's where it's going to wind up, for us anyway. And, and folks, these people that are so uncertain about the future, and want to know how their life ends, and they go to these human beings to tell them how their life's going to turn out, and they don't know. Only God knows. And you know, we, we find that concept in this verse of Scripture, just one verse, uh, John chapter 11 and verse 4, if y'all would stand with me. And we're going to read it. I'm going to back up to verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him. Now remember, they sent to Jesus because Lazarus was sick. Okay, And he was critically ill. He was about to die. So they sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, 
but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to understand. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, help us to learn from you tonight and learn that everything that happens in our life is for one reason and one reason only, and that's to glorify you. And Heavenly Father, I pray that we might be able to accept that, even though it might be very difficult for us at times. For we pray it in your name. Amen. Listen, <clears throat> there's one thing that I have learned, and that is only God knows. Only God knows. There are some things, there are questions that will never be answered. You know, there are some things, there are mysteries in this world that will never be answered. And you know what? I thought about it. Boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God if somebody else. Let me tell you something. When I get to heaven, I ain't going to be worried about what happened down here. It won't matter anymore. You know, it just don't matter. If God wanted us to know the answer, He'd give it to us. But listen, only God knows the future. In Isaiah chapter 41, we're not going to turn to it, but it's a story about uh, Isaiah, and they had a bunch of idols, a bunch of false gods that they were worshiping in the land at that time. And, and so God was speaking to Isaiah, and He said, this is what I want you to tell the people. You tell them to tell their idols. Go ahead, make your case. Where's your argument? Go ahead and show me the facts. Go ahead and tell me what happened in the past so we can look and see how it's going to affect the future. You tell those idols to go ahead and do that. And you know what? These were just idols. They were just statues. They were whatever, you know. They didn't know how to predict the future. They couldn't predict the future. But God could. Because only God knows. He looked at these, at these idols and He said, You are less than nothing and your works are useless. And folks, all these people that want to know about the future and go to these mere human beings to try to find out, you know what? They're less than useless. Because they don't know. They don't know. God knows the future. You know how I know He knows the future? Because He's the one that controls it. And whoever's in control knows what's going to happen. And folks, that's, that's where we are kind of in our country today. We don't know what's going on, but God's still in control of everything. You know, it's hard for us to keep our mind wrapped around that when we see all the bad things that are happening in our country. When we see th things that are leading us down the path to socialism or whatever, we don't understand it. But here's what we need to remember, is that God is still in control. He's still in control. And God has told us how we're going to wind up. He has revealed the future to us in a limited capacity, one that we can understand so that we wouldn't be uncertain and so that we could be encouraged. Look, He reveals the future to us so that we'll know, number one, He is God. Okay? All those items, you remember the story of uh, uh, the prophets of Baal, they were up on the mountain and they said, okay, we're going to offer sacrifice to the prophets of Baal. You know, prophets of Baal are going to offer sacrifice to Baal. And then I'm going to build an altar over here and we're going to, we're going to sacrifice to, you know, ask God to, to, to burn the sacrifice. And we'll just see who wins. Who's the true God? And we all know how the story turned out. The prophets of Baal did everything. I mean, they were almost to the point of committing suicide trying to get Baal to set that, that altar on fire. And it just wouldn't happen. And so, you know, I finally said, you know what, Lord? I think they've done enough. Would you please go ahead and show them who you really are? And boom, he consumed that sacrifice. Folks, let me tell you something. <clears throat> God knows the future because God controls the future. God is in control. We have to keep that in mind. And He shows us this to show us that He is God. He proved to everybody on that mountain that Baal was false God and He was God. God is God. And that's why He reveals some of the future to us. He also does it to warn the ungodly of the coming judgment. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants everybody to go to heaven to be with Him. He loves everybody. And so He gives us a glimpse of the future, not only to show that He is God, but also warn those who are not saved that they need to be saved. But He also shows us the future to encourage us. Folks, listen, it doesn't matter what happened in this old world. It don't matter what happens tomorrow as far as uh, the churches, as far as anything else. When everything is said and done, I know that I'm going to be in heaven. I know that I'll be with the Savior. And folks, that's an encouragement to me. You know what? That Just that fact, just that knowledge 
ought to give us courage like we can't believe. Because God cares for us. We need to remember that. Look, only God knows. And, and right here, Jesus said that this sickness of Lazarus was not in death, but it was for the glory of God. Stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus said the outcome of this would glorify God. You notice he didn't say that what the outcome was. He didn't even mention that. He just said this is not unto death. Now, as a human being, what do we think? They're not going to die. Jesus knew better, but he said it will glorify God. It will glorify God. Do you think Mary and Martha thought when they sent to Jesus that their brother was going to die? They knew there was a possibility, but they also knew that Jesus could heal it. And that's why they sent word to Jesus. They sent word and said, Lord, the one that you love is sick. And they expected him to come running and heal him. But, you know, when Lazarus died, <clears throat> they had not heard what Jesus said to the disciples about this will glorify God. But let's say that they had. Do you think they would have understood it? Absolutely not. How could this glorify God? He died. If you had been here earlier, you could have healed him. See, they didn't realize just how powerful God was at that moment. And they thought God would have been glorified if, if Jesus had been here and healed our brother. They didn't understand that he was going to be glorified anyway. You see, they, they couldn't see how God could be glorified. But how much more so was God glorified when Jesus didn't just heal him, he raised him from the dead. After he had been dead for several days, there was no, you know, I don't come to think of it, I don't think I have heard of any body trying to refute the raising of Lazarus. You know, they, I mean, there's people that refute the crossing the Red Sea, well, it was the Sea of Reeds, praise God, it's a bigger miracle, people drowning in what any water. You know, I mean, I, they, they come up with all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And I don't think I've everybody ever heard anybody refute the raising of Lazarus. There were witnesses. People saw him dead, and they saw him come back to life. You can't dispute that either. And there's only one person that can get the glory from that, and that's God. Folks, listen. Jesus said this is not only death, it's for the glory of God. The outcome would glorify God. He said the resurrection of Lazarus was glorifying to God. What does it mean to glorify God? It means to acknowledge Him for who He is. For who He is. What was it? I think it uh, I can't remember. Uh, Janice, you may have to help me here. Who's the group that sang that song, Lord, I praise You because of who You are? I can't remember who that boy Anyway, it'll come to me in a while, in a little while, and I'll probably stop and go, hey, I don't remember. You know, we ought to praise God just for who He is because we're supposed to glorify God, and that's what it means to glorify God. They said the resurrection of Lazarus would glorify God. Why? Because only God can do that. God was glorified in the lives that were changed of those who witnessed it. Now, if you go on down and read a few verses, it says when Christ raised him uh, from the dead and he came out, that many Jews believed on him when they saw this. Do you think God was glorified when those people believed in Jesus? Absolutely he was. Absolutely. You see, everything that was done, this whole story is about glorifying God. Let me ask you a question. Have you been changed? Have you glorified God? Have you come to the point where you can die to self? You know what? There's a lot of Christians walk around and I look at some of them and I don't think they're doing a real good job of glorifying God. I don't think their life is very glorifying God. And you know what? I'm not disputing that they're Christians. They may have come to a point where they ask Christ to come in their heart, but they haven't died to self yet. You have to die to self to be able to glorify God. Have we done that? Have we taken us off the throne and put Christ on the throne? Put God where we are right now. You see, He was glorified in the fact that, that He raised Lazarus from the dead, but He was glorified in the fact that there were people that believed on Jesus because they saw it. He was glorified in the fact of the effect it had on the disciples. You know, we kind of lose sight of the disciples in this story, don't we? Really, we do. Because... 
Think about it. They've been with Jesus all this time. And, and we're getting real close to Christ's crucifixion. They've been with Him for nearly three years now. Okay? And, you know, they had learned a lot. They had grown in their faith a lot. But they still didn't really understand the extent of the power of Christ. They might not have, they might have thought, okay, this is a great man sent from God. They didn't understand this is God. This is God. It had an effect on them. You know how I know that? Because after Christ was crucified, what did they do? They reached thousands for the cause of Christ. All over the known world. They went, and you know what? It changed them so much that they were willing to give their life for Christ. And they did. I'll accept that. John. And he was exiled. And died alone on the Isle of Patmos. See, God wasn't quite finished with him yet. But all of them, it changed their life, and God was glorified by that. How many lives do we influence? And how do we influence them? That's the question. How many lives have we influenced in the past week, two weeks, whatever? Have we had an impact? And how have we impacted them? Folks, let me tell you something. God's glorified when we influence people for Him. He's glorified with that. It affected the friends and family. You know, if you read this, when He died, it says that many Jews came to them. You know, it, it's, it's just like we do today. We still have this thing today. If someone passes away, and Lord, we have had our share of that this year in our church. We? That's seven this year. And it hurts us. But you know what? The outpouring of sympathy and love for those families has been tremendous. You know, we want to go to our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ in their time of hurt and in their time of loss. And we want to try to help comfort them and let them know that we're thinking about them. And that they did the same thing back then. Many, many people came. And they, they uh, tried to console Mary and Martha and the family. And they wanted to be with them to show support. Let me read something to you. Uh, go down to verse uh, 19. Let me see. Verse 19 said, And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. In other words, they came to comfort them uh, because their brother had died. Okay? And so they were there. There were a lot of people there. But then look at verse 45. Then... After This is after Jesus raised life from the dead, okay? Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. It just didn't affect the people that were standing out there in the cemetery. It affected the people that were ministering, the, the family and friends of, of, of Mary and Lazarus and Martha. It affected them. It glorified them, or glorified God in their lives. It glorified God in the disciples' lives. It glorified God in the ones who were there at the cemetery and witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus. Everything about this story was intended for one thing. And Jesus tells us what it is right there in verse 4. He said, This sickness is not in the death, but for the glory of God. <coughs> There's something to learn here. Nobody is immune from troubled times. Nobody is immune from sorrow. Nobody is immune from losing someone. But how do we pray during that time? That's the question. How do we pray when this trouble comes? We know that no matter what comes in our life, it's going to glorify God if we are His child. So what do we pray? We don't understand it. We don't know why things happen the way they happen. We don't understand how they happen the way they happen. But maybe we need to start praying, Lord, I don't understand it, but you do. And Lord, I want you to be glorified. That's a hard prayer to pray, isn't it? I want you to be glorified, God. But help me. Help me to trust you through this. You see, that's something that the sisters hadn't done yet was trust Jesus. They trusted Him to heal their brother, but they didn't believe He would raise Him from the dead. But Christ had a pretty big surprise waiting for Him. But it doesn't end just with glorifying God. He said this is to glorify God and that the Son of Man, Jesus Himself, might be glorified by it. 
Jesus was glorified too. <coughs> you stop and think about it. How was Jesus glorified through Lazarus' death? Well, he was the one that raised him from the dead. He was the one, only one that could do it, okay? Stop and think about it. Anything that glorifies God glorifies Christ. You know why? Because they're one in the same. They're one in the same. We don't understand that. Our minds can't get that concept, but God said it, and I believe it, and I trust it. God and Christ are one in the same. So if God is glorified, Christ is going to be glorified. Anything that glorifies God glorifies Christ. <clears throat> and this is revealed, or this incident revealed Christ as the one uh, who is able to deal with any situation. You know what? We get in certain situations, we don't know how to, we don't know how to act sometimes. We don't know what to do. You ever had a time in your life when you sat back and there was a particular difficulty you were going through and, and you just said, Lord, I don't know what to do. you got to help me. I can't, I can't figure this out. I don't know which way to turn it. We sit there and we think about solving it this way and solving it this way. Here's a hint. Just sit back and say, God, take over this and do this for me because I don't understand it and I don't know how to handle it, but God just showed me the way. And when we get to the point where we can trust God, get us out of the way, and trust God, I guarantee you God will be glorified. In Christ is the only one that can deal with any situation that comes up. He can get, deal with death. He can deal with sickness. He can deal with anything. <clears throat> you see, I, I think one theologian said it this way. When God wants you to trust Him, He puts you in a place of difficulty. That, that seems kind of hard, doesn't it? But when God wants you to trust Him, He puts you in a place of difficulty. Okay? When God wants you to trust Him greatly, He puts you in a place of impossibility. In other words, there's really nothing you can do about it. You are just at a loss. You are stuck. There's nothing you can do. And you don't know any way out. When God wants you to really trust Him, when He wants you to trust Him greatly, He puts you in a place of impossibility. But here's the good thing. <laughs> nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. It might be impossible to us, but it's not he can work it out. He's already worked it out. But Christ was also glorified by what was to come. You see, if you stop and think about it, this incident right here <clears throat> didn't happen too long before Christ went to the cross. This was the incident that kind of lit the fuse, if you want to use that terminology. The leaders, the Jewish leaders that won Christ gone and out of the way, the ones that have been trying to kill him for a long time now, this incident right here was the spark that lit the fuse to the dynamite that was going to blow it all to pieces and they were finally going to get Christ to the cross. And you know what? They didn't understand. That's exactly how God had it planned. You remember I told you a minute ago that God's in control? <laughs> he was in control even through very bad situations. Even though his son had to go to the cross and die, he was in control. You see, he was glorified through the cross. You know, and I look at this and I'm encouraged by it and I think, Lord, when I go through hard times, let me remember this. Let me remember that you want to be glorified. Let me remember that, that you want me to trust you. But folks, let me tell you something. Suffering still hurts. It still hurts. So we have to think, but Christ suffered first. Christ suffered first. And the Bible tells us He will never allow us to go through anything that we can't handle with His help, and He will never ask us to go through anything that He hasn't already done. He suffered, and He triumphed. And so will we. We will suffer in this life. Christ says that. Christ says, look, just because you're my child and just because I love you doesn't mean that you won't have hardships just like everybody else. We will. We will suffer. But we also will triumph because Christ did. And we're His. Father, I thank You tonight that You were glorified in this incident. But I pray, Heavenly Father, most of all, that You will be glorified in our lives. Lord, I pray that everything that we do in our life would be for one reason and one reason only, and that is to glorify You. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that You would in a special way be with each and every one who is here and those who couldn't be here. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that whatever they're going through right now, that you would be glorified. Heavenly Father, I pray that they might see that, that they might be encouraged by it. And Heavenly Father, I pray that they would trust you no matter what comes. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church, for these people. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of serving with them. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless our efforts. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be glorified not just through this church, but each of us as individuals. And Father, we'll praise you for it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. So I'm